Welcome to the the Sunday Roast with Mike and Danny. This is Danny and this is Mike and we're kind of strange. We're in the tub and we drink a lot. At least one of us does. This is not Mike's body, but that is Danny's. And that's really gross. Thanks for watching the Sunday Roast. We love our fans. And here's Danny's mom. His name's Michael. Is it? Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and he's a Jew. You can tell he's a Jew. Look Ask at him. him who's his daddy. Magical moment. I can almost taste Danny. It's so close, I can almost taste the wall. <laughs> and now, the moment you've been waiting for. It's the Sunday Roast with your hosts, Magic Mike and Danny the GFP. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> All I can say is that I need to up my game on the hybrid squad <laughs> intro for next season. I no, lower your game. Just give up on your game. That's how we managed to manage to do that. There is no game. <laughs> that game has been called offside by VAR. <laughs> <laughs> the best part of that was your mum coming in. <laughs> Ask him who his dad is. I asked her about that. She said, why do you say he's a Jew? I said, because he never uh, is either. He's, he's constantly going on about the fact that he lived in London once. I don't know if he's ever told you. And mm -hmm. that he's Jewish. Oh, yeah. Kensington, <laughs> Harrods, went tonight, St. John's Woods. I mean, I've heard it all. I've always caught the show after the intro. So today I got to see in all its glory. And my goodness, my eyes and my heart and my soul will never be the same again. <laughs> It is. Uh, if, if people didn't know with me this tonight, it's 10 o'clock here. It is three o'clock in the afternoon in L.A. It's the wonderful Sophie from the Highbury squad. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's actually 2, 15, 8 hours. Oh, of course it is. It's eight hours. Not, like, yeah. It's not winter anymore, is it? You had a little yeah, batch no. where you were seven behind. Yeah, so yeah only, and in uh, the last five weeks, I was 10 hours behind. So that was always a challenge. That was crazy. But here is, we are. Yeah. So that, do you yeah. tell people what you've been doing for the last few weeks? Because fight you've been home away from home for what four and a half weeks? Yes, and wow. I'd like to add that I will let the squaddies, if there are any of them in chat. I think there are some of them, but oh, Mike's I, come up with a name for our lot for the Sunday roast. You lot are now oh, officially roasties. The roasters. <laughs> the roasties. <laughs> How shit is I that? Think, I think based on. The old school news of the world connotation with the roast. Maybe the roasters. Oh. Oh, there's so many things wrong about this. I don't know it's, how we're going to get through it. But, it's going yeah. wrong in every direction. It's a nightmare. <laughs> so tell us about your, your, your leaving home and then being away for so long. Well, I, yeah, it was really hard being away from Tony and Vinny and Vesper. Um, but with, with COVID, um, I, <laughs> I had to kind of delay my trip to go see my mum and dad. My mum and dad are 85 and 84, respectfully. So that was really hard, kind of not being able to get to see them for a long time. So and how, then some, how long were you there before you noticed you had it? And, and did you, were you allowed to go and grab them at any point? It, what do you mean? Like, no, no. It, it, during COVID, you mean, when we were in lockdown? Oh, well, I thought you meant because you got you were tested positive when you are over I was. There, yeah, I was. And I was in a room on my own. I, my mum and dad were like, you know, they're, they're too old to take that risk. So the day I landed, um, I did a test and it came out positive. So I was locked in a room. I hadn't seen them for three years. And then for the first six days, I was actually, you know, in, in lockdown. I felt fine. I felt great. I was one of the lucky ones, touch wood. And um, they would deliver <laughs> my mum bless her we'd have conversations from my room and she was in the garden old school style you know over the fence oh i saw that meryl bought a new rabbit <laughs> you know well, almost like when you were a teenager and they grounded you and you were stuck in your room 
Yeah, exactly. Which is stuff in Greek food underneath the door for you. So day one, I had moussaka. Day two, I had dolmades, a.k.a. in Cypriot terms, Eskulbebia. Um, you know, Cockney Turk and Harry knew exactly what was happening. Um, you know, day three, it's, you know, kyoftedes, that's Greek meatballs. I mean, it was just bring the food. It was like staying in a boutique hotel for six days. And after the two weeks in London, I have to say the first three days, I kind of needed it, Danny. Like the yeah. downtime, the solitude uh, yeah. a little bit. But it was frustrating. But um, in the end, we ended up having a good time and got to spend some quality time with my mum and dad. And then the two weeks in London were amazing. Chelsea game, you know, the Man United game and then the West Ham game. And then I left and what happened? Yeah, we turned to shit. We went, as it's known in the trade, went full Mike Feinberg when she left. Yeah. Because he has that effect on people, not just football, but people in general. <laughs> Things turn to shit when he's around, especially well, he's chairs just... and furniture. Yeah, definitely the definitely furniture. Um, his first time around was pretty good. His second visit was not good at all we didn't win one game while he was there uh so yeah but it was this that's the point where i you know as arsenal fans we just get it's the hope that kills you right but beating chelsea that night and beating man united at home in the fashion that we did and it just so happened that night like you know thierry was there dennis burkamp was there uh, robert perez was there it was just the vibe. Jacka scores that amazing goal. I'm sitting next to Maria. You know, I mean. I saw that. Did she do one of her specials for oh you? Oh, my God. She totally did. And, you know, we had a little, say, tinkle. I helped her go, you know, I helped her get up the stairs. And the But the, they look after her there so much. You know, it's really beautiful to see. And thanks to Mr. Jack Stevenson, I had the most amazing day. He, Jack he, the um, truth. Oh, He's just he's just a top shelf guy. He arranged, um, you know, breakfast for me at Alcedo's on the Holloway Road. Fa you know, family friend owned local joint, really just top notch stuff. And and he was in San Francisco, coincidentally, because we were going to meet here in California. And I ended up with his tickets. And it was just amazing that day. The Man United game. It was just top notch. And Jack made it all happen. Bless him. Really good stuff. Yeah, Michael's here. Here's the picture of you and the very special Aww. lady. If people don't know, tell people what she does. I mean, Maria has been, and you know, I don't know if people know, but she's Greek too. So not only do I have a kindred spirit with her because she is an Arsenal woman through and through, but she's also Greek. And she kind of grew up in a very ethnic family where, you know, she grew to love Arsenal and had, we've had so many fantastic conversations you know, over the phone and become friends. And, you know, she's the type of woman that led the way for women like me to be accepted in football. And Maria is beyond special. Um, she fought every stereotype along the way. And I don't know if everyone knows this, but she follows every single Arsenal team. And when I say that, I do not stutter. It, she, she follows the men the women's, the under 23s. She goes to reserve games. She supports at every level the club through and through. And she is one of the most unique, special people that you could ever meet in your life. She's still loud. <laughs> she can still, <laughs> you can still hear her. Kevin always says, he goes, I could hear her from, you know, wherever she was. I was on the pitch and I could always hear Maria. Um, you know, she's just been a staple of, People talk about Ian Wright being an ambassador and, you know, all of these players. But Maria is probably one of the most precious ambassadors by default in the sense that she's just always been a fan and and has been for like, I don't know, how many decades now? She's just really unique. She goes, she, she waits, she times it perfectly until the crowd's a little bit quiet <laughs> and then she screams, Come oh, on, you gunners! And I heard one person only ever shouted, shut up, you silly cow. And the old, whole whole crowd turned on her while it was at Highbury. I, for years, I had no idea what it was. And then she was come and stood in front of where I sat at the East Stand at Highbury. And she got some kind of award. And I said, is that the lady who does the shouting? You think it would be some big old bird, not some dainty woman like that who's 
who was quite old back then. Didn't she used to be a teacher? Yeah, she was a teacher oh. and um, a local as well. And she has some, she saved everything. I mean, she has not memorabilia, a shrine. I mean, she's got the lot, you know, and she's been there through the good, the bad and the ugly. Ooh. And uh, someone like her also has helped as much as, you know, Wrighty and of course having plays like Miedemar and, you know, fantastic people in media who support the women's game. Maria has also really helped with that too. So, you know, long may she be around. And to see her when I went out there because we had just become friends over the phone and just kept talking about football, you know, to actually then meet her in person and give her a hug and everything. That was a really special moment for me and probably one of the highlights of my trip when I was in England. If the club had any sense, they, they'd do something to um, to mark all of her years of going. Maybe a, is a statue too far, do you think? Uh, no, I don't actually. Not for her. No. Um, it's amazing, Mike. Um, Mike, Danny, <laughs> that bastard. <laughs> <laughs> He'd sent me another dodgy video just before we came oh, on air, so that's why. I've not heard um, from him since he's been here. Well, <laughs> it's probably because the karaoke evidence is out there. So, oh, you know, oh. a few people are laying low after Friday night. Let's just keep it at that, shall we? Um, but, you know, when the, they really do love her at the club because it was half time at United and we, we were sitting next to her, to, you know, her person was next to her. And then I was in the seat after and... um we were talking about the first half and then she mentioned that she needed to, you know, you know, go to the bathroom and stuff. And I was like, Oh yeah, let's go together. And so she's obviously starting to struggle with walking a little bit and stuff and kind of chokes you up in a way too, because you want her to be around forever. But let me tell you, the staff were right there. Mm. The Arsenal staff, the way they love her and look after her is amazing. And, you know, she is really taken care of when she's at the stadium, when she gets in, how she gets out, everything. And I, I really, that warmed the cockles of my heart, to be honest with you, to see that because she really deserves it. Uh, that's, uh, I didn't realise how much the Arsenal do for people with needs. I mean, I've been going for years, but I don't need anything until you read Dave Seeger's book, um, Arsenal. I know he changed the title of it. Is it Arsenal for Everybody? Arsenal for Everyone, yeah. Yeah. Oh that and uh hold on oh, oh she's got the book gonna go and get it hello uh demsec and phil and mark and brady and cm and mike hurts i have just seen rambo the latest rambo film mike hurts fucking ruined by mexicans yet again you're still in my bad books um hold on there it is the... uh do you want me to sign it because i'm in it aren't i i have this is a very special signed copy that we're going to give away on the show Oh, um, Dave has signed it, but someone else has signed it, and I'm not going to reveal it. I'm oh, going to do something special. Do you? You might know who it is. I think but... I do. He was signing it. I've not even seen the picture of me in it, or did he take it out? Am I still in it? No, I thought you were in it. Yeah, there's a it's meant to be a picture of me with Sean on my lap. Yeah, I thought I'd seen you in it um... because I, I also had, uh, you know, Dave had shared a few chapters with me before it uh, it came out. Um, but it's wonderful. It's a it's a great book, and you know it really underlines the community, not only in the UK but around the world as well. So yeah, I I just I have it there because I read a I try and I'm, I've almost you know I read a chapter when I'm looking for a little bit of in, Arsenal inspiration where I want to throw my memorabilia and my kit out the window and burn it. it all. <laughs> Oh, mate, I'm not taking it anymore. <laughs> like today, yeah. but anyway, yeah. Oh, oh dear. Um, yes, yeah, lots of people there. I've got stands one up there. Um, I think you, you young lady, need to explain yourself. What was going on here, hooligan? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a more? If that was me, first of all, you wouldn't see my head above that. But if that was me, <laughs> I would have that printed into massive size and framed and put on my wall. Yeah, it's going to happen. Gonna, it is. I it think has to happen. I'm, I'm just waiting for Tony to do it for me for like Christmas or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just after we had scored our second goal against Man United. 
and um, Marky Mark, you know, um, who does a lot of stuff for diabetes Gunner and runner. runs Gunner Runner and um, wonderful man and a very 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 good looking gentleman. Yeah, very cute. And I bet um, he smells lovely. He does. He always smells oh, good, and bastard. he's top shelf. I'm, I feel like his mama. I, in fact, the other person he was with, I feel like I'm their mama. Is James Johnston, who oh, is my get- my meatloaf. Whenever I see James, I'm like, and I would do anything <laughs> for love. Did he let you run your fingers through his hair for yeah, not? At the tolling. My mum, my mum would love to grab hold of him. She'd she'd plait it. She'd she'd brush it. She'd condition it. She'd love. Yeah. I mean, he's just a. Uh, so they they were sitting below me and after we scored they were like doing this and i took a picture of them and then they were like oh we'll take one of you so i just went and it and everyone had <laughs> just sat down and it was just timing and the moment so i've got mark and james to thank for that yeah oh that is really good see what Special i'd be tempted day. well i'd be tempted to do that underneath where it says arsenal.com i'd have the hybrid squad I'd hybrid have, squad uh, yeah yeah, yeah that that's james. a good idea and when Next people season? come around and go yeah we sponsor arsenal it's been there for years <laughs> genius idea i love that That would be good so um you're one of the most interesting people that i've ever spoken to because apart from the world of football you've had a previous life didn't you know every time i meant i say have you met this person have you met that person you go yeah oh yeah yeah i've sat in a car with so and so i've helped so and so do this so what's some of the, the the best ones that you're allowed to tell about people that you've met show off drop names i want it i want all the juicy stuff i love it well i can't be more interesting than you know, Ars blog or Stilberto or Gunner blog. Surely not. Have, have they ever sat in the back of a taxi with that Welsh actor who was in The Father? Back of a, <laughs> uh, a limo. That was yeah, that's him. <laughs> Anthony Hop- Sir Anthony Hopkins. It was him, wasn't it? You you sat it in was, a limo. Yeah. With? yeah. Tell I us mean, that. I mean, I I was brilliant. a pub. My career, um, you know, has been being a publicist in the entertainment industry, and I worked for 20th Century Fox, Sony Pictures, and MGM. And my job was to look after the talent when they promoted films. So a lot of my friends and family say, why don't you just write the book and retire? And I'm not a telltale girl uh, at all in that regard. There's a lot of things that I can probably share and some things that, you know, you just can't unless you want to end up being Julia Phillips. Remember that book? You'll never eat lunch in this town again. And she didn't. And then she died. Uh, So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's. I've always thought about ways to write it in a kind of fictional see, way. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but yeah, that was my job, and so I got to look after. Wow, where do you start? Uh, <laughs> I mean, twenty years. I mean, tell them how, how you got into it. Because you told me that once as well. That was really yeah. So I mean, I wasn't I it? was yeah. It was persistence. I just kept writing letters. I wrote a letter every day to Twentieth Century Fox when I was in college still, and I just kept saying, you know, it's my dream to work for you. I I don't. I think it was maybe because of Star Wars and the movies where I gravitated to. <laughs> It is quite epic. And I just, uh, I remember sitting at the top of the stairs in my mum and dad's house, um, you know, because I couldn't afford to move out. Uh, I was living with my mum and dad. And so I made the top of the stairs my desk. You know, I had the telephone, I had a notepad and a pen, and I just used to write them a letter. And then I'd write to Universal and Paramount Pictures and Warner Brothers. But Fox was the company that I really wanted to work for. And um, one day, as I was sitting there, the phone rang. And it was them. And they said, look, we're looking for a production, an assistant. Uh, Can you come in and see us? And I go, I'll come tomorrow. What time? And so I went in to visit with them and I I met with the vice president. Um, He was the vice president of like the production. Uh, Alien 3 was being shot at the time in the UK. And I walked in and they offered me the job on the spot. And I took it and the rest is history. You know, I made so much tea in the early days danny and I, I, I perfected my tea color i don't think anyone could perfect tea the way i did actually i even i made tea for daniel day lewis because i was assisting on the casting for the last of the mohicans which is a really great movie and he and michael mann were doing the casting because some of the times other film companies would rent our space 
to do stuff when they were shooting in London or doing pre-production in the UK. And Michael Mann was the director of that movie. And if you guys don't know who that is, he's the director of Heat, Miami Vice. Miami he's, Vice. Uh, yeah, he's directing the um, new movie about Enzo Ferrari. I mean, he's a legendary film director. And I made Daniel Day-Lewis a cup of tea in an Arsenal mug. I mean, come on, why wouldn't you? Yeah. And he said, you know, I really liked you at first. He goes, but if you're going to continue to make me tea in an Arsenal mug, I'm going to have to say you're fired. And I, 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 I was young and I'm thinking, oh, my God, one, number one, call cool, Daniel Day-Lewis just fired me. But two, I realized he was joking because he actually, which shocked me, he was a little bit of a Millwall fan. Um, it's not being Irish, it's Man United or Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, no, not as well. And also, he's just so unique. So we had a bit of a laugh and... You know, those moments were kind of really precious for me, like going onto the set of Alien 3 and like you see Sigourney Weaver and you're like, wow. I mean, Aliens was my favorite film ever. She was a hero for me. And there I am standing with a clipboard, you know, having just made another cup of tea. And, you know, I'm just taking notes. David Fincher talking to Sigourney Weaver and the my boss talking to the producer and them talking about budgets and you know, how long filming's going on for. And I'm just like, wow, this is insane. And that set was insane as well. And there was another film that we were shooting at the time with Michael Douglas and Melanie Griffith called Shining Through. And then if you fast forward a few years, I actually ended up looking after Catherine Zeta-Jones when she first met Michael Douglas and Melanie Griffith um, when she got together with Antonio Banderas and worked with Catherine Zeta-Jones on The Mask of Zorro. And she was a baller. Melanie Griffith was a ton of fun. You know, just uh, those. Th there's a couple of stories there that I have to keep secret, maybe tell you off camera. But <laughs> let's just say that that tour of The Mask of Zorro was pretty epic. Um, I never saw that film. It got, didn't do very well, did it? Actually, it did very well. Did um, the sequel didn't do as well. Uh, ah, it was Catherine yeah. Zeta Jones's Homecoming. So that was Did actually they change Banderas to somebody else in the sequel. No, he was in it and she was in it, but it just wasn't that great. And um, but the whole homecoming, she had just come back to England after being away for a while. And it was like I wanted to write this headline as being responsible for the PR in the UK because it was a royal film performance, too. And it was like Catherine the Great comes home. And my boss said, no, I want I want them to arrive at the at the cinema together and Banderas in the middle, Melanie Griffith on one side and Catherine on the other. I go, that's not the move. It has to be her. She's the star. She was the darling bud of May. She was the British Rose and it's her homecoming. And I tell, I guarantee you will get the cover of every single newspaper if we do it this way. So she, she literally said to me, she goes, okay, this is on you. And I said, fine. Um, and Banderas and Melanie Griffith arrived first, and it was cool. And then Catherine comes out the limousine, and it just went crazy. And we got every single newspaper cover the next day. I still have some of them at my mum and dad's place. And the headline was, Catherine the Great Returns. And it was just probably one of the highlights for me as a publicist who set out to, to kind of execute a strategy, and it worked, you know. And she was a darling. Talk about darling by the May. She was a darling. She was absolutely a delight to look after and beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I went, to, <laughs> I think I could tell this story. I went to, she was having a pre premiere event at her, in her room at the Lanesborough Hotel with her whole family. The Welsh contingent just descended on London and they were like, a cack, as you can imagine, drinking champagne, eating canapes, Danny, just having the best time ever. And I knocked on the door just to make sure everything was okay. And she opened the door and she was dressed minimally. Ooh. And I was like this for the first time, like, you, you know, you have to be stoic. And I just, I think I was like this. <laughs> I mean, just breathtaking. You know, it was like that scene when she first comes into the Mask of Zorro on the horse and you're like, oh, my God. Michael Douglas saw her in that and he said, I have to marry this girl, which he ended up doing, of course. He did, and still are, aren't they? They are, yeah, yeah. And um, when I drove her off to the airport, she was actually going to Deauville and um, that's the first date she ever had with Michael Douglas after that premiere, which was kind of crazy. And yeah. he was a dish in his time, wasn't he? 
Oh yeah, Michael Douglas. <laughs> what a dude. He could, he could play the rich guy so well. The, the the edgy, I mean, what an actor. Top shelf. Loved him. From the streets of San Francisco too. That was just a top yes. shelf show, wasn't it, back in the day? I often see that when it's rerun on ITV four i think it is and uh he looks so young in it i know what film i was thinking about they did one of cowboys and indians one and they played an indian and i think it might have been um brad pitt they had the the white paint going across his eyes and it cost an absolute fortune about 10 15 years tonto is that it uh the character he played was that the one there was a Oh, God, I remember seeing that in an open-air cinema in Athens and walking out thinking, what is this crap? Yeah. Um, anybody in the chat knows, do put me out. No, was that Val Kil- it was Val Kilmer. I, I think know. it was Val Kilmer and Michael Douglas. Look it up, you guys. It was. Oh, no, Michael Douglas wasn't in this one. Oh, no? Oh, okay. No. It was, uh, you know, the old, uh, the old cowboy Oh, film. Legends it of was... the Fall? No, no. Um Oh, it's annoying me. Someone's gonna have to find it in the in the chat and tell Who's me. Who's in what it? Who tell me? Brad Pitt and who? I think it's Brad Pitt. I always get Brad Pitt. There's a couple of those I always get mixed up. And rather than having played having the cowboy as the main character, he had the, the bloke playing the Native American and he had the white paint going across his eyes. It's a Johnny Oh, Johnny Depp, maybe. That's annoying. Yeah, not sure. Yeah. So have you been in any films? if we pause them, can we see you in anything? No, I did a favor to a friend of mine many years ago on a one of Angelina Jolie's first ever films with Johnny Lee Miller called Hackers. Um, my one of my best friends, Nan, was the casting agent for Extras, and so we ended up in the Lloyd's Building of London. And um, I'm in the background, but you really can't um, make me out too much. Uh, no, so no, not really. And the I always Ranger. preferred being you're the Lone Ranger. Yeah, that was a dud, wasn't it? That movie. That was good. Yes, that's yeah. what I was thinking of. So, have you had chances to be in films? Then, yeah, I have, but I always enjoyed being behind the camera and doing that that work. Like I've always wanted to be a producer, like make my own content and stuff. And I, just, I think that's why I love radio so much because. There was no visual. It was just a voice. And to keep people engaged, you know, just with a voice, I thought was always a really tough but interesting medium to tackle. So I started doing that in the early 90s in on London Greek Radio, which still goes today on 1033 FM in London. It was the staple station for the Greek community. And they wanted to do a show aimed at second and third generation Greek. So they let us speak in Greek and English and um, started doing that and did it for a few years. And that's where I kind of got into covering Arsenal a little bit. I used to get to go to games at Highbury as well. Um, so this I before, was, before you moved to America? Yeah, this was before. I mean, I was I was a supporter of the club then. But then when through the radio station, I used to get to do a few bits and stuff. So I always loved the medium of radio. Uh, and I just always loved the idea of creating ideas that would help kind of move projects along, which is why, you know, let's say I worked on a film called Minority Report, you know, with Tom Cruise, and it was my job was my responsibility to come up with ideas of how we're going to promote that film from a PR perspective, not only in the States, but also, you know, across 53 markets and licensees around the world. And that for me was the thrill that I really enjoyed doing that, even even though I had pissed. Oh, I just remembered I pissed Tom Cruise's people off. Yeah. Did you see him without his shoes on and then pat him on the head and put him with the boy? <laughs> I imagine he is a pain in the ass. You know what? Um, he's a gentleman. I've met him twice. I met him when I worked on Minority Report and he was a gentleman. And I met him when I was head of PR at Columbia Pictures in the UK. And he and Nicole Kidman were shooting Eyes Wide Shut in London for Stanley Kubrick. And during their off nights, they always wanted to watch a film. So their people would call all the different film companies and say, hey, do you have a new print in? Tom and Nicole would like to come and see the movie. And um, there was a film I was working on at Fox at the time called Great Expectations with Ethan Hawke and Gwyneth Paltrow. 
and we had just gotten that in and they said, yeah, we'd love to see it. So I went to meet them at the theater where they were going to see it. It was just, you know, um, just the two of them. And I remember sitting there waiting for them and it was a very windy London night and the doors opened and Nicole Kidman walks in and she had that crazy hair, Danny, like the curls yeah. and everything. And it was another wow, kind of Catherine Zeta-Jones. I was like, oh, my God, wow, she is so beautiful. And it was them in their pomp and in their heyday, probably around, was it 99, 99, 2000, I think, maybe 99. And, um, and I greeted them. They were very sweet, very nice. And... Um, I hadn't seen the film yet and I was working on it. And Tom said, he goes, hey, have you, have you seen the film? I go, actually, no, I haven't. But I do need to because I'm doing the PR on it. And he, he's like, why don't you watch it with us? No, I'm busy. <laughs> I was like, did, did Maverick just ask me to watch a film with him? I mean, <laughs> did he? <laughs> um, and I was like, cool, yeah, sure. You know, I'll, um, I'll watch the film. So I went into the theater and... I sat all the way at the back so they could have their privacy and sit at the front. And he literally was like, what are you doing all the way back there? Come down here. And then, you know, halfway through the film, I'm like leaning like this and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm in a movie theater and I'm watching a film with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. This is so cool. I've not had a few, I've not, that's happened to me two or three times, once with him and the other time was with Anthony Hopkins, no doubt about it, but that didn't happen to me often. Um, but that was pretty cool. That was a pretty cool moment. Hated the film, but loved them, loved that experience. Um, Brady's Banana um, asked, um, did you work on, oh, here we go, True Romance, with one of the I most did. iconic intro songs in it. Like, you could just listen. Is it Hans Zimmerman did that music yeah, for that? Yeah, Absolutely I did, amazing. I did, not, I did not, but a friend of mine worked on the PR for that in the UK and had a blast doing it. Um, in fact, he had worked on, not that Tarantino directed that one, but I think he produced, did he, was he one of the producers on that? I think he, he wrote had, it and then sold it and that's what paid yeah. for everything. I only know because he was on Joe Rogan recently. Otherwise, I've had no idea, but I think he sold it and that made him enough money to go and start making his own films. Yeah, and my what friend Daryl worked on, you know, Pulp Fiction and Jackie Brown and, you know, a, a whole host of Tarantino's films when they came out in the UK but that was, those films were fun. I remember when he started working at, when Buena Vista was formed. So it was like when Disney kind of went adult, if you like, and Miramax kind of kicked in. And he said, come and watch this film. Um, it's really good. I don't know if it's going to make it, but there's a, there's a, the, one of the guys in it who wrote it as well is going to be there and it might be fun. And I'm like, sure, fine, why not? I'm not doing anything tonight. So I went to see it and ended up being Goodwill Hunting. And at the end of the, the oh, screening, wow. at the end of the There's screening, ben, ben Affleck um, was there and kind of did a QA and a and stuff like that. Those are the things I really loved, like those moments in the industry. Like when I first started working at Fox, um, I was like, wow, I get to watch a film during the day and give my thoughts and feedback on it. This is amazing. And I remember going, and I'm showing my age a little bit now, but I am 50. I'm going to be 51, kids. Hold you're my not. hands up. No, you're not. Yeah, no, it's true. Can't be. Um, and I remember they said, we're going to go watch a film. We're looking at bringing out a Christmas. We're not sure how it's going to be perceived, but we kind of like it. Went to see it. The film was Home Alone. And, you know, it was, wow. you know. And then another time... I'll never forget, um, we go down to see a film and it was actually not our film. We had just passed on the film. And then they're like, we've passed on this, but we're going to watch it anyway because we have the print. And I, we were like, okay, fine. So we went to see it. And actually, Sean Connery watched it with us because Sean Connery had an office in our office. And I remember oh, someone went to take a piss. That was when he was younger. Oh, my, oh my God. God. stunning. And someone someone went to take a piss during the film and the door kept opening and the light came in and um sean connery shouts out well someone shut the bloody door <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was oh. it was so funny and the film was ghost everyone passed on that movie 
Like, and then it went into turn. It went into what they call turnaround. Yeah. And um, and then it got picked up. But those mo- those things are pretty cool when you kind of see those things happen, and you think, "Wow, I can't believe." Same thing with Dirty Dancing. Everyone passed on that, and then it became happens a lot, you know. I didn't like Dirty Dancing, but I did like Ghost. I mean, that was wasn't that Demi Moore's or Demi one of yeah, their Demi. first films. Yeah. Amazing. That Sean Connery, though, I often, you know, it makes me really sad. I'm getting old. I get emotional with a lot of things now, the older I get. I was thinking the other day, I started thinking about death a lot. Mm. I've had eight friends and family die in the last few years. Colin, the spider catcher next door, died. A lot of it because they wouldn't stop smoking or drinking or combination of the two. And I was thinking, and and I'll go through the, I've got a a bookmark of the Guardian page for the, the obituaries. And I go and have a look at that. And then you think, all these old people, when mm-hmm. you see someone old who's in their 80s or 90s and they die, go back and Google them, you know, Yahoo them and have a look at how stunning most of them were back in the day. It's like I was listening to the, um, I think I was listening to LBC and it was um, maybe Steve Allen and he was talking about, I oh, know, wasn't it Joe Rogan again? And he had an, an, an actor on there and he said, there's this one woman back in the 1920s. She was Irish, lived in America. She's an actress. She refused to do the casting couch thing. And so she never really got as far as she should have done. But she came out publicly and talked about it and said, I'm not doing it. And I went back and had a look at pictures of her. And you think, oh, my God, all these people, they were all stunning. And Sean Connery and uh, um, who was uh, the other? Roger Moore. Yeah. And they, oh, Rockford Files. I mean, I, I'm, um, I, mean I, they, I, I can say with them, I can say men and women, they all look stunning whether they do or yeah. not, with, if they do. But the bloke from the Rockford Files, she looked, yeah, I, I think – what it must have been like to be living in America and be famous, a film star or TV star in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And I wonder, I think, what were they doing in their day-to-day life? They get up and they go out and then everyone wants to speak to them and there's no mobile phones, there's no mm-hmm. no social media and all that. I think, must be amazing. Well, like the Cary Grants, the um, Rock Hudsons, the, you know, Sean Connerys. You know, sometimes when I drive through L.A., I get – nostalgic and i i i think uh, if i'm going through a place like laurel canyon which is very historic in terms of people that live there things that happen there especially music and even just going down sunset sometimes and you think wow i mean imagine driving down here in the 40s or 50s you know and what and what that was like and so when i looked after older actors you know um really felt special and it's funny when I worked with Sean Connery at the time he was working on Rising Sun but he also had a production um, office in our offices and he was working on the development of Entrapment um, another film with Catherine Zeta-Jones and I was in awe of him and his presence he was imposing he's like I don't know six foot plus so walking through Soho Square with him you know, he's going to get stopped. You know, people are like, wow, that's Sean Connery. And he was such a cool guy. Uh, the post, the po- you know, back in the day, you remember you had the mail room and you had a guy who was in charge of the mail room and you had mm. the mail boys who, who were always trying to be an agent or move up, you know, in the system and stuff. And he was obsessed with Sean Connery and he was a bit, <laughs> he was a bit of a pill as well, but he meant well. So he would take his mail into him every day and he'd get all nervous and stuff. And one day he went in and, He's like giving him his mail and he's like, um, oh, man, you know, you, you're so great. You're such a great actor. And, uh, you know, I, I love all your movies, Steve. He goes, every single one of them, Steve, I just love them. <laughs> and Sean Curry turns around and he goes, that's very nice of you, Bob, but who the hell is Steve? <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> you know, that was. You that think was, you're Steve McQueen or something? Yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, it was kind of it was kind of crazy. But he that's how he dealt with stuff. And that's how charismatic that he was. And. You know, Gloria um, Gloria Stewart uh, on Titanic, you know, the, the old lady with the necklace. Oh, yes. You know, she was a baller. Like, that was a royal film performance. Prince Charles came to that, and the whole cast was there, Leonardo. And, um, and she and Frances Fisher, who at one point was married to Clint Eastwood, and, you know... She had a boyfriend with her at the time. And she I was like, are you 100 years old? And she was rocking it and still a baller. But if you look back on her films and the films that she was in, it was incredible. 
you know, to see her history and exactly what you're talking about, you know, um, Silver Screen was really special. And there are a lot of people who have done a lot of films that you might not think of, but I think that was a time when film was really trailblazing, avant-garde, you know, I don't mind that people love Marvel comic books now, but I'm I'm not a fan personally. The fast food films. Yeah, I love the art. Having been on set, I love seeing a scene that doesn't require a green screen and there's actors acting and making moving you in some way or making you laugh, you know, and that's kind of what I'm a fan of. Yes. Um, people wonder why I speak to my mum the way I do. Anybody who's done a podcast with me before might have heard me talk to my mum. And I talk to her like I would talk to somebody my own age because my mum's 79 and she's still spiky, still drives, she's still cheeky. And then my brother asked me, why do you speak to mum like that? I said, I'm not speaking to her any different because she's an old. She's old. I still call her an idiot. I still take the piss out of her accent. And I still call her and when she, she picks on me. I go, wait, don't you touch me because she'd go past me and she'd jab me in the ribs so i do the same thing to her but you've got to remember these people were young they've been younger than us i mean i'm mm -hmm. 52 this year and you, you just because you see an old person trying i always try to remember the person that they used to be like demsec here roger moore is the saint my god yeah what a start that right is chiseled yeah it's so many uh oh simon yeah. templar was the saint before it was did that yeah and then um like i i i'm not a a connoisseur of films i just watch a lot of films i've watched in since january the first last year i watched 164 films there's Amazing. only one i've watched twice which is nobody with bob erdenkirk in it i watched it and my friend anna come around and says you've got to watch this film so i watched it again but i rate them all and i've only the 164 films there is only eight films i've given a nine out of ten to shall i tell you what they are yeah i'd love the to father know. great film that made me uh, that brought on my hay fever as i like to call it uh nobody true romance i forgot that was made released in september 93 and that yeah. film only because i can't give anything a 10 that is absolutely stunning that film and it is. stands today i love watching yep. films that still hold that's amazing fury with brad pitt one oh, about yeah. the tank yeah oh uh, that, br mm -hmm. that brought on Sh my hay shia fever. labeouf shia labeouf is great in that film is if anybody wants to go and see I me mean, i do like these world war ii films because it just you need to watch those and see fuck me everything i have in my life is so easy mm -hmm. and these poor people were the, the stuff they went through rocky four nobody hate me and i've not seen the the, the second version of rocky four um hacksaw ridge I oh i that. loved that movie that that brought on my hay fever more than once in the what film. a story that's that's, the, the fact true that that's a story. true story is unbelievable there are people like that in this world incredible and the uh the, the other one that got a nine out of ten the greatest showman <laughs> i don't see that one <laughs> you've not seen it no i'm saying i can't see where the 10 came from on that one oh it's but... a nine all those got nine i can't give anything a 10. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I play the soundtrack. I mean, my music choice is awful. I, I, at the moment, I've got a playlist that I've got from it's called um, Ministry of Sound. This is misleading. Electronica eighties. They did three albums, all with wow. three CD, and I've taken all my favourite ones off. They're like there's um well there's a whole load of them. I listen to them today. The last one before that I listened to was uh, um, um, Hate is gonna hate woman. What's her name? Mm. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, yeah. <laughs> to her album. And then if I put on the uh, the, the not, Greatest Showman one. Oh, I love The Greatest Showman. That is one of my... I love, the, I, see, were you, I love Rocky IV soundtrack. Oh, it's That's a so great soundtrack. Not inspirational. Um, ad it adrenaline makes you wanna, rush. Yeah. Hearts on fire. Oh, don't. I mean, the whole Give thing. Me the willies. Oh, yeah. Mike says, I'm going to sign off, but let me say, I appreciate Soph exceeding my contributions with her magnificence. But yeah, someone's wrote that for him because he's probably drunk wow. in a gutter in North London. Did a PR person write that for you? He's <laughs> <laughs> probably about to order a pizza and pass out. Yes. Miss you, Mike. And uh, he should be back on next week. Um, people are picking out old films. Uh, Stan the Man. Stan, not Stan the Man. Stan. Um he's one of the Stan the Man sixty eight. Yeah, it is. Yeah, actually. I was called it, it. I used right. to call it yeah. that. 
yeah but now to call him stan because he's, he's we've allowed him into the abw whatsapp group and it's a mess it's, uh, it's <laughs> all to do with football people just moaning and me saying come on who's free and no one replying and stan That's stan has funny. seen it he's seen it from the shadows um I torrent a lot of stuff, and so I go and get um, a load of films. And I've got one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I've never seen it's a good it. one. Um, Saving Private Michael, Ryan. Michael Douglas produced that movie, and he actually his dad wanted to play the role of um, Douglas. Gladiator. And uh, he he did not give him the role. So one flew over the cuckoo's nest. That was in the, the mid seventies, wasn't it? Yeah, late late seventies ish. And that yeah, was I producing know. then. Yeah, yeah, yeah talented man maybe late 70s one of the guys will tell us in chat but yeah he yeah. produced that and he his dad wanted the role i might if i remember correctly um, saving then, private ryan first 20 minutes amazing they actually got proper people with proper limbs missing to do that is that film would get a 9.5 mm -hmm. that is right up there with some of the greatest films ever made brilliant is that uh, and to think that was a, a kind of modernish film. It was probably laid in, in the late noughties. I mean, late nineties, early noughties. I think. Um, I'm not too Tom sure Hanks. About that. Do you rate Tom Hanks? He's got oh, to be up there with one of the best ever, isn't he? Right. I've got a bookmark here, and it's got my favourite actors in it: Tom Hardy, Tom Hanks, um, uh, Keanu Reeves, Jessica Chastain. Oh my God, she's stunning. Yeah, Matthew, Ma her. Matthew Mahogany as they call him, not McConaughey, Mahogany, his later stuff. If you haven't seen the Dallas Buyers Club, get your tissues ready and go Great and watch film. that. That is a beautiful film. A true story mm -hmm. again. Denzel Washington flying a plane upside down. Uh, most I of the love stuff that movie. Done. It's been stunning. Hugh Jackman, I like a lot of his stuff. Clint Eastwood. My God, oh there my is God. a man who has led a life. Don't, well, go, don't go and watch his latest film. It's shit. Um, but, um, the uh, cry, what's it called? Yeah, um, he makes. I love one of my favorite films of all time is The Bridges of Madison County. Um, he directed that, didn't he? He directed it and starred in it with Meryl Streep. Brilliant. Mm. Tony's auntie um, was a socialite up in Northern California, and her best friend in the whole world was Clint Eastwood's mum. And so we used to get some amazing stories. Um, they used to go eat at the Mission. Mission Hills, uh, he, he has a place up near 17 Mile Drive, you know, along the coast there where the, where Pebble Beach is and, you know, because he was the mayor of Carmel as well for a few years and Tony's auntie lived in Carmel and um, was an art, uh, a painter, artist and, uh, yeah, she used to be friends with Clint's mum. So fam fabulous man, fabulous man, amazing. Um. Not glossing over that. I want to say this before Mike goes. He says today was a was a special day. A hug from Big Kev Campbell. My daughter gleefully spending the day with me, and at this very moment spending quality drunk time with Elliot and Ask Blog <laughs> at the Tolly. Life is good. Well, tell him that me and Sophie both said hello. Give him a the kiss. Actual Ask Blog Andrew is the actual pod father. And when people call I love me, him. that I say no. If anything, I might be the pod mother. You because are. we were the fifth, we were the fifth one to do it. So there's three others, but they're not around anymore. And what Elliot, and I mean, in fact, what Elliot and Ask Blog did, best part of a hundred and fifty thousand pound for charity. Amazing. Um, how do you do that? Well, massive fan base and working hard. And but I think if ABW had a whip round, we'd struggle to get a tenner. So, uh, <laughs> well done to them. And but also, I don't, if I had that much money, I don't think I'd give it away. I think I'd go and spend eighteen grand on that new electric chair. No, it's, it's great that they're um, they're so good at what they do, and it is. they've you know they just have a, a like they're here. You know they're um, really respect them. And I, you know after you, uh, Ask Blog was one of the first ever guests I had on my show when I started it. Uh, Andrew, of course, who's always been so supportive from day one, and I've gotten to know Elliot. A little bit too since you know being in the states and i love him and clive to bits and you know not only do i love talking football with them but they're really good humans all of them so i love seeing good people do well it's really it's really cool and you couldn't have extended your stay anymore because then you'd, you wouldn't be allowed back in the country would you if you stay away for too long but you could have easily made it another two three weeks and <laughs> yeah, so much for sure. stuff to do i had a That's blast expensive. i mean it was great being back at the games 
I wish we'd sing another. Well, I, th- I guess now we do have to sing another song other than that Mikel Arteta song. I was getting yeah. a bit bored with that. I'm like, come on, like sing another song. Why are we There's just so singing this from. over and over again? It was just getting a little bit boring. And in a sense, it came back to bite us on the ass a little bit. But oh my God, Gran Torino, that's a great movie. That, that'll bring a tear to your eye as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a whole load of, I don't know if it's an old age thing, you get more emotional about stuff. But um, talking about songs, what would be your favourite Arsenal song? Have you got a favourite three? Um, my favourite all time is, he's blonde, he's quick, his name's a porno flick, Emmanuel. <laughs> <laughs> Another 70s reference. That is, that is sheer genius to ever come up with that. <laughs> Who came up with that? No idea. I mean, um, I don't think anything comes close to that. It doesn't. Do you? Isn't that the greatest song ever? It is. Well, the Newcastle one for Philippe Albert. Philippe, Philippe Albert, because everybody knows his <laughs> name. <laughs> well, when the, one of I the mean... stewards at Highbury used to walk, he, he had a thing for wearing cowboy hats, and he'd walk past from the West End to the <laughs> East End via the clock end, and da, 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 the whole <laughs> clock end would start doing, yeah, and start doing the, that as the poor the... bastards walk by. <laughs> the other song I just love the most, and I had to switch my phone off today because I have a lot of relatives and friends who are Tottenham fans, and I kind of started going and then I'm like, wow, I've opened up Pandora's box here and I just shut the box. But honestly, when I'm feeling a bit blue, I just went on YouTube and I played this today because something they can never take away from us doing it twice. But we won the league at Shite Heart Lane has to be up there with the best of them. And when our fans sing that in unison and with such voice, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's the best. Um, Loki's got a good one. We love you, Freddie, Freddy. because you got red got hair. hair. <laughs> uh, that was that is an absolute brilliant one as well. I mean, the walking in a bird can wonderland, where the podcast got its name from. That's another great one. And we were the first to really start that one, don't you feel? Like other teams cottoned onto it, but I felt like we were one of the first to. There's only one. Dance. Yeah, and then, that's the way, yeah. though, isn't it? They all, yeah, yeah. Everybody nix each other's ones and slightly adapts them. But I think for me, the peak of it was the the early Arsene Wenger days. We had a different different sort of uh, fam go to the football. It was more grungy, more dirty. Um, everything was cheaper. There wasn't so much on telly, and it was the very end, probably up until the Invincibles. That was towards the end of football being proper. Uh, uh, um, mm-hmm. A thing you, if you wanted to see it, you had to go. I mean, maybe even '98 might have been the end of that, because yeah. uh, now it's become ugh, just everywhere. There's too much. Yeah. Well, look, the the song that Stan just put up in the chat. You probably our fans will probably get in trouble for singing that today, considering how soft everyone has gotten. You know, it was um, uh, when we <laughs> I didn't even Spurs. know. My old man said, "Be a Tottenham <laughs> fan." I said, "Well, but you're a." It's <laughs> the best. And you can say all the words. Oh, can I on your channel? Yeah. Oh, of course you can. <laughs> yes. Um, oh. I mean, uh, Arsblog makes a point of uh, making saying the C word as often as possible, and he's one of the yeah. team. He's at top of his game. Doing, doing just fine. Doing just fine. He's, uh, he's uh, not doing too bad, is he? No, not at all. Uh, Archangel said, he goes, I was really enjoying this show until you started talking about Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we do nothing but talk about Arsenal. How long do we, we were saying on the show today, it was me, Stan and Carl, and we said, oh, looking forward to a break from football. And I said, yeah, Carl, yes, Stan, but how long, when you're looking forward to a break from football, but how long will it be before you start missing it? He went, about a week. How long for you before you start going, there's nothing to do. I've I got think this, to do. I think this season... Um, because I get busy doing LA Galaxy stuff. Not that it's the same, of course, it's just different. Um, I think I'll survive for a couple weeks and then I'll be like, okay, when does the new season start? <laughs> but with the women's Euros coming, um, there's there's that to look forward to. I think it's gonna be a brilliant tournament. I really do. And uh, but yeah, it right now we're jaded and we're gonna do our end of season review show tomorrow. And I think after two weeks, I might start jonesing again. But mm. I am looking forward to a few days off, yeah. you know. It's, it's been a really, weird. like, 
blood-sucking season. It's been, at times, yeah, I just thought, oh, I can't go through this again. There's actually been a couple of times I thought, I don't even want to get out of bed to watch the game. Usually when we're on our run of three or four shit games in a row. But um, I have confidence it's going to change, don't you? Next season, a decent summer like last summer. Yeah, but a decent summer like last summer is the same summer. We need a little, we need to crank it up a notch summer. I don't mind getting another Tomiyasu or another Ben White or another Ramsdale. But the point is, is that you build around those players with even better players. Like, you know, we need a couple of world-class players. Every top team has them. Even Tottenham have two. And that tastes like vinegar coming out of my mouth, but it's true. But they're both 30. They've not got They are, left. but they're, they're, you know what? Um, the way people look after their bodies, new medicine, new technology, they've got at least two, three years strong in them. They look after themselves, those two. And, you know, Saka will be a world-class player one day, hopefully, but that's, what, two seasons off? I mean, you Zlatan know, played today and he's 40. He just won these. Uh, he's just. He's just almost. What happened today in Italy? Look what he's done: smoking a cigar and, you know, <laughs> doing his thing. Balotelli and scored five goals for his team in Turkey. Did in you one see game. one of his goals? No, doing the step, the step over, and then the back heel. The um, the what's it called? Oh, damn, I'm having a brain fart. <laughs> oh, when the 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 crossover back heel. Eric Lamella scored one against us and won the Puskas last season. Uh, 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 Michael says Someone, it's The Rab Rabona, thank you. Thank you. Did he? Did he's guys are on Johnny on the spot. He was a great player, though. Not to have on your team, but a great player to be playing in your league because of his antics. Well, he was gold, wasn't he? I mean, look, Balotelli was funny and gave good sound bites. Zlatan was world class and gave great sound bites. One of my favourite times in football was covering him when he was in LA. I don't think I'll ever have a better He's time. Debut. I mean, what a goal. And he he made that rivalry. You know, he lit up not only LA, but the States. Only David Beckham's been able to do that. And I think Zlatan did it in a different way. His bravado, his zero. You know, David was c c concerned about image, whereas Zlatan gave zeros. I'm Indeed. surprised that he, he managed to. Uh, he came back, didn't he? He played for Man, did he, Man United, yeah. and then and then he got. To if, if he hadn't have gotten injured at United, who know who's to say that he still wouldn't be there playing the way he is? He missed the UEFA Cup final, didn't he? Or Europa League final? Europa League, but he played in the League Cup final that year. And you know, people can bitch about Mourinho all they want, but that was the last time. Well, they won those two, and then Van Gaal was Van Gaal's FA Cup after Mourinho or before. I have no I idea. Yeah. But, yeah, Zlatan. This is why I think we get snobby. Like, I was talking to my cousin today and I said, I'd love for us to make a cheek cheeky move for Lewandowski had we made the Champions League, right? Bayern he's like, said he's got one left, one year left on his contract and he's going nowhere. That's what they've said, but I think he wants to join Barcelona and they're mm. pretty interested in signing him. Um, And... My cousin's like, oh, come on, give over. He's done. And I said, this is what the problem is sometimes. We're so snobby when it comes to certain players. Like Tammy Abrahams, had we made that move, how many goals could we have got? It's the difference between Champions League football and not having Champions League football. And I see you know, someone's mentioned Giroud in the chat. And I always say, like, snobby. People, dis he's the most underappreciated, one of the most underappreciated Premier League fans, uh, fa players ever, Giroud. And we've never really replaced him and what he brings as a plan B, let so alone we had plan a system a. That, we had a system that worked. You needed someone for the corners who's going to come up and uh, header it in. And, and so Arteta he ended up loved, having... Yeah, but Arteta loved playing through Kieran Tierney and crossing it into the box, right? How many Didn't times? Not. 155 <laughs> times in a game. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know this season we have lost six games by a single goal and we drew three games? So that's nine games. And if we'd have had a player who'd have scored one goal in any of those exactly. nine games, we, um, or any of the draws or uh, any of the goals in one of the other ones, all it takes is two goals and we'd have finished above them. Two goals from a striker in 
nine games. Anyone could have done that. The number of players that are out there that haven't played this season for clubs because they don't want them, they don't fit in. We could have gone out and got two, three, four loans in the in the January transfer window. Make it very clear you're here to the summer. Now come in here and make everyone see how good you are. Even if we'd have got, I know he tapered off and stuff, but someone like Veghorst in our team with our players could have made a difference coming off the bench. Tammy Abrahams could have made a difference, but Chelsea were never going to do business with us. You know, with him, January, we let Aubameyang go, which I completely agreed with. We scored 21 goals in December when he was benched, you know, but you have to bring in someone who's going to replace what he wasn't, let alone replace him, but what he wasn't doing. And, you know, Kev says it on our show all the time as a striker as well. I mean, look who's our top striker this year and how many goals they've scored. 12, Saka. Yeah. And Emil Smith-Rowe's next. And then yeah. um, Gabriel Magalhaes is after, scored, and then Martinelli, right? He scored five got league goals this season. Lacquer got four. Gabriel, um, the the, the <clears> centre back <throat> one. How about this? This is is this just how football's going to go in the future? Mbappe, mm. if people don't know, he was meant to go to Real Madrid, one hundred and thirty million, I think, something like that, and he opted to stay at PSG. And uh, they've put out a list of all the stuff that he'll be doing. He's got a say over the other players, what, who comes in over the manager, who the director of football, so Pochettino, and uh, who's the um, the Brazilian director of football? I can't remember his name. Um, so, oh, Leonardo, terrible. Leonardo, that's it. Yeah. How can how old is Mbappe? Is he what twenty five? How can a player with twenty five? Four, I think. Same age as my child, and I wouldn't let her do. I wouldn't let her do the online shopping. And this <laughs> bloke's going to be having says at a football club just so they can keep him. And that does that show a complete lack of ambition from Mbappe to stay in, quite frankly, a shit league where he only uh, has to play half the games a season to win the title. Does the pirate listen to this show? Just asking yeah, for a friend. No. Uh, yeah. I didn't think no. so. Okay. Um. I find that to be distasteful. Now, I'm all for people doing well in life. Kudos to Mbappe, you know, from where he's come from and what he's achieved. And at such a young age, being part of a winning team at international level and, you know, rising to the heights, being the, the, the Prince of Paris. But one of the things that I do like about American sports, I know that we don't have relegation or promotion here and towards the end of the season it can get a little boring but having salary caps and having rules in place that benefit all teams to make it a bit of an even playing field makes for a better season it may not be- make for a better end of season but it's cyclical in a sense with more frequency than seeing long-term dominance like city you know um I don't think they'll ever win the Champions League. I don't think a team like that PSG. can. No, because they're not building a team. They've they've created a dictatorship of they're a player. They're playing FIFA with real life, getting all the best FIFA yes. players. Yes. And look, Real Madrid have gotten a taste of their own medicine. Welcome to our world. You've been doing this to teams for years, you and Barcelona, and now you're both paying the price. So I don't have sympathy for Real Madrid, but I have a, I have sympathy for football. And, you know, what kind of message does that send to the team? Are you going to want to, what kind of ego are they building with him? How can he be humble? Will he? Maybe. I don't know. Is he a talent? No doubt. 100%. But to pay him a million pound a week, give him a hundred million pound signing bonus and to allow him to make those kinds of decisions, that's a real slippery slope. Big time. Someone made, someone made a really good point on Twitter the other day. I know that's rare. They said, but look at that state La Liga is in now. They've got no stars there. No. And you look, I, I was thinking, they've gone and bought a Young who's 32, end of his career. They're getting players on free transfers, like they've got Aguero on a free transfer, end of his career, never got to play. They've got Memphis Depay, Depay another good one. I think, they, I think they got him on a free transfer. Danny Alves, what's it, thir- just looking here, 39, re-signed him again. And you've got players like you know, Dembele, £105 million. And what has he done there? Well, that's why um, that's why I think in one regard they want Lewandowski there. Um, they badly wanted Mbappe there for all of the reasons you just said. I mean, the league suffered the same way the NBA suffered when Jordan retired. It was like 
you have something that comes cr- close to godliness and when it disappears, everything else seems so average. And that's what happened when Ronaldo and Messi left. Because this is the problem when you build something around a singular individual or two individuals. The reason the Premier League works is because it's got several stars. It's got teams as stars. And it's not just one or two teams. It's five or six. You've got top quality managers. You know, you've got ex-players who've played in the Premier League managing. And that's why as a package, it works. But I really don't want to see the Premier League or a team in the Premier League go down the PSG route. That would be catastrophic. Not that it isn't like Haaland, a half a million a week, Danny. I mean, how old is he? What has he done? Yeah, it's been a Dortmund fan I've seen this season. That remember when when Thierry Henry played, we were magnificent. When Thierry Henry didn't Henry didn't play, we struggled because we were used to give the ball to Henry. It will do everything, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that's how it's going to be for Haaland. They've just had a season and a half of not really playing with a striker. Now they're going to have to adapt and play and change their style again. But I suppose with Pep still in charge, you have got a a, a plan. They they've got somewhere where they're going to go. But if, with PSG, it's whatever's hot at the time. I'll have him. Oh, new manager. He won the league and they get lost. How many times have PSG had managers that have won the league and then sacked them because they, they won the Champions League? Exactly. And it's got number, nothing to do with the Liga. Look at the number of... Uh, you can sum up PSG by looking at Neymar. Out of the 38 league games a season, how many does he play? Half of them? Well, look what happened with Sergio Ramos. How much were they paying him and how many games did he play? This season, oh, and Donnarumma. I mean, they it's just want crazy. I want, they want everything. Oh, there he is. I'll have this person and I'll get him on a free. And they just go. There's no, there's no consequences. There's no budgeting. And then you, you look at some of the other teams like the mighty team, Khan, C A E N. They're they're floundering in the middle of uh, of League Two. Chris's team, Lorien, they finished one place above. And uh, Jeremy Smith, uh, journalist friend of ours. His team Mets, they went down in the last minute on the last day yeah. or the last few minutes on the last day. They got battered. Think, this is why they want a, a European Super League because then you can get all these teams. They can take all their money. You know, I think that maybe football might be better off if all the big multi-billion pound teams all fucked off. And then, then we might get our game back. But unfortunately for us, Arsenal will probably be one of those teams that fucks off. But then you got the, Euro- the, uh, the Champions League in two seasons' time, a group of 16 teams. What the fuck is that about? Well, this is all gearing towards that coming back, isn't it, Danny? I mean, if anyone thinks the Super League's going away, it's not. It's just, they're just trying to, say they're trying to, but obviously what happened is the fans spoke out, but now gives them an opportunity to retool it in a way that is digestible for fans. But it's it can't go away. They've invested too much time and and money in that. and And adding two more teams... Or adding, however, is it two two teams to the Champions League? Um, crazy, you know? That's Just like the, the World Cup, they added more to the World Cup. It dilutes the product at the end of the day. I'd say to people, this is what I think is going to happen. There's a YouTube link I've given you there. Do yourself a favour and go and watch it. It's a one hour and 36 minute documentary called Once in a Lifetime, The Extraordinary Story of the New York Cosmos. And you oh. see such par- such levels of parity, maybe they're not the right words, of what's mm-hmm. happening with PSG, with Man City, with all these these teams and all these. Um, so if you're at home, go and have a look for Once in a Lifetime. Just look, for, it's a free one and a half hour documentary on YouTube. You've, I take it you've seen it, so. Yeah, I had the pleasure yeah, cool. of interviewing the late, great Carlos Alberto. Oh, um, the Brazilian who, manager. Mm-hmm, who played for the New York Cosmos and became an ambassador for the New York Cosmos and got to talk to him just before the Brazil World Cup. Fascinating conversation. I'll share it with you. You know, mm-hmm. he talked about Messi and Neymar and Ronaldo. He never thought Brazil would win the World Cup at that time. But, you know, Was the time... the 7-1 semi-final? Yeah. Lost. Yeah. yeah. And That's... it was just fascinating listening to his take on football. You know, probably played in one of the greatest teams international teams ever scored one of the greatest world cup goals ever and 
this there was a purity about that and you know he was part of a cosmos team that was galacticos right that was the time where all the sexy superstars came to the states to play mm. um but it didn't it didn't short term it was fun but long term it didn't didn't work out did it you go and have a look at the I mean, even if you look on wikipedia sometimes like we had uh george best went and played in in the um mm-hmm. M, um NASL North American Soccer League. They had a, an indoor and then they had a, an outdoor one. But you're looking at 1971, 4,500 average attendance. Next year, 72, 4,200. 1974, 3,500 average for the New York Cosmos. And that was 1974. By 1978, 47,500. 79, 46,000. Yeah. And then a few years later, 84 down to 12,000. And then that was it. Two years of magic. I mean, Beckenbauer yeah. played there. Um, a lot of a lot of players went, and it was just it, you have to have sustainable models, right? Which is why some Arsenal fans believe in the structure of our club and what we're doing or trying to do. But there's sustainability, and then there's stubbornness as well, right? I would say Liverpool have a sustainable business model that somehow they attract at a very good price, by the way, world-class players. Like, Le- Diaz is going to be a superstar at that team. Mm. Everyone thought when they bought Mo Salah, he was sloppy seconds, Chelsea reject, even though he hadn't been at... He went to another league before he came back to the Premier League. You know, they found Mane, yeah, they found Firmino. That Everyone laughed at them when they paid... Se- the most... That- 72 million for Van Dijk now seems like cheap money. A bargain. And everyone laughed at them when they spent that money, you know, but they're smart. I know that they're not very popular with opposing fans, but the way they do business and the plays they attract, it's smart. They've got a very good coach and, you know, that's the model I would like us to follow. And some people compare us to them, Danny. I don't know if you do in terms of where they've been and where they've kind of moved to with Klopp. And stuff, but there's a big difference having a manager like him and having a manager like ours who's still learning and growing. You know, answer to this question is Portland Timbers. <laughs> oh, you love your answer. Timbers. My, they scored seven goals in a game a couple of weeks ago, they're still shit. But there is, um, Carl made a point on the pod today, which is something I would never consider. If you can track back the, the re emergence of Liverpool as what they're doing with the um. The Coutinho, Coutinho money. Mm-hmm. He said, "Would would we would I take two hundred million for Saka if someone made an offer this summer?" I said, "No, I wouldn't accept any money." But he said, "We could rebuild the club." Would you? If that if that was the criteria, and you're guaranteeing me the success that Liverpool have had, and the type of players, you can't guarantee it, can you? You can guarantee. A tr- well, attention. this is the what the what if game. If you're saying to me that we could do what they did, would I sell Saka for two hundred million? The answer would be yes. If there's no guarantee, then I'm not taking that risk. As and as you can't guarantee, do you think he no. will end up going though? I think I, what worries me is he wants this clause in his contract, which I keep saying on the show. When he's hanging out with Foden and Trent Alexander-Arnold oh, and all those guys in the England camp and he's going to be doing it again at the World Cup and he sees them winning and talking about winning and, hey, no, man, is. come on. Come, come to Liverpool. Come come to Man City. Look what we do. You could win stuff. Exactly. And exactly. he's 20. You can convince a 20-year-old to do anything for a bag of fucking sweets, let alone 250 grand a week. That's what worries me, Danny. Uh, Martinelli, I- Liverpool, Klopp loves him. He loves him. To worry. This is why it's not that, look, I think getting back into Europa League was the goal. It's obvious it was the goal. And the fact that he got us kicked out of Europe and we're back in Europe. You know what? You got us kicked out by the man that replaced you replaced. And now you got us back in. Okay. Very good. But the fact that we had the ability to qualify for the Champions League in our own hands and we found ourselves in an improbable situation and we didn't capitalize on that. That's what scares me about the ambition. I don't care what your plan was in the summer. Now we're here. The goalposts have moved. So what are you going to do about it? 
and they didn't throw the kitchen sink at it. And that's, if I'm Saka, I'm like, why didn't we go get a striker? You know, it's like when we had Alexis Sanchez and Santi and Ozil, we didn't get like proper centre backs. We didn't get a defensive midfielder. You know, we didn't build around that. It was one marquee player a year. And this is what worries me. We've changed the personnel, you know, in the hierarchy, but we seem to be doing the same things. Although the last summer transfer window gives me some hope that we've got better. You know, our scouting is kind of back to being a bit better. But at the same time, you can't keep doing the same thing without elevating the game. And that's what the Champions League was going to do for us. It was going to elevate the game financially and who we could attract. Not because we could win it. We, hey, we might have been humiliated in it. But how do we know that? If you don't, if you if you have a world class striker, if you have it's the ultimate test, yeah. And we whiffed. We had the chance to build a uh, build on the squad, and you know, we didn't. We didn't. Um, yeah, Moss said. I've seen him in your chat before. Um, Moss said sports talk uh, talking about Beckham, Bauer, and Pele all came to NSL, NASL. Um, Insigne, Shakiri, Shakiri was a weird one going there. Chik- Chikorito, your lot. Chicharito's playing for my lot, yeah. yeah and actually, Messi. Chiellini, Chiellini just signed for LAFC. What a what a career that man's had. You ain't going to argue with him, are you? He he, yeah. he is slower than Tony Adams on his slowest day, but still a magnificent defender. He's is, a baller. Is Messi coming? And will Ronaldo, because of his um, the uh, the law case he had against him, someone told me Ronaldo isn't allowed in America. I don't know if that has come down on him as of yet. Has he bought um, his way out of it yet? I don't. I don't know. I can't answer that question. Dodgy but ground, I think. I think he wants one more. Look, he's not going to get a shot at Champions League at Man United. He probably thinks he's got two more years at it. I mean, look, where would they be without his goals this season, Danny? Uh, that is. That is the perfect grill. I say to um. I remember growing up all my life. I'm 52 this year. Most of my friends from about the age of 17, 18, 19, 20, all smoking, all drinking, never smoked. I'm not really a drinker, not been drunk since 90, 94. Had a couple of wild years. Uh, they're going to the raves for two years, but that's done me no harm. I mean, I can, I've got tinnitus, and I I swear sometimes I've had helicopters landing in my back garden on the day that England played Switzerland at Euro 94. I woke up because a helicopter was landing in my garden. Turns out it wasn't. It was the after effect of stuff. But apart from that, but... <laughs> And that's why I'm not ill. That's why I don't have any real... I mean, I've got a bit of arthritis in my shoulder and I'm obviously sat down since the 90s. So that's got nothing to do with it. The point is, Ronaldo has done that his entire life. And this is what you get, boys and girls. You look after your body, don't abuse it, and you will be fit and healthy, hopefully, until your late 40s, early 50s, maybe 60s. You see some of these people. And at the time, it may seem uncool and unhip to go, no, I'll have the celery. I've never eaten celery in my life. Or I'll just drink water. Or I'm not going to go and spend hours laying out in the sun. And then this is this paying off. I mean, this bloke is magnificent at, what is he, 37, did somebody say? Mm-hmm. He's better at 37 than 99% of the players in the Premier League. And That's he's still got it. I tell yeah. you, we're going to find out in years to come, Sophie. He's actually an alien from the future. He's <laughs> taken, when he's still playing football, when, when Stanley Matthews still playing at, was it 43? He, he can easily yeah. be playing at 43. And Stanley Matthews wasn't even an alien. I mean, I know endurance why Tom Brady doesn't go through the same thing Ronaldo does, but he takes hits. It's a different kind of pain, oh, right? Fuck does he? He, yeah. he oh, takes oh. some smacks. <sighs> and think about how long he's taken those smacks for. But again, he's able to play until this age because of how he's taken care of himself. It may be boring, but it, what, has he picked a team yet? Is he going to be at Tampa Bay? He's going back to he's going back to Tampa. Yeah. Oh, I mean, what a, I mean, people who don't, I mean, I know I've been an NFL fan since the 80s when it was on Channel 4 and picked Miami Dolphins. I was mugged off. But that bloke, to go and, and leave New England after they won the Super Bowl, then go to Tampa. I mean, what the fuck are Tampa? What have they ever done? They've won it once there, before. They have. That years, years before. Yeah, yeah with um, John Gruden. Yeah. Go there and win the Super Bowl with Tampa. The year after wow. he left. Yeah. The very next year. The Crazy. stuff of, and then I see the tweets going around joking about his mum saying that the the world, the NFL teams need to thank his mum for making the NFL so interesting. Isn't his brother one stuff as well? 
N- no, he's Is the it? no. Isn't no. there two quarterbacks? He's got, he's got three. Famous. He's got three sisters, and he's the only son. Um, two brothers. That's the Mannings you're thinking about. Oh, Peyton Eli, and Eli Manning. Yeah, yes. who both won two Super Bowls. One. Both won two Super Bowls each. Both retired now. Are yeah. they? Yeah, I yeah. can only ever name two um, Miami Dolphins players, Dan Reno and Ricky Williams. And all I know about Ricky Williams is he gave up NFL to go and smoke weed. And uh, yeah, who can really him. blame him? You're looking yeah. quite tired. Should we wrap this up? Yes, that'll be uh, – let's let's do that. Yeah. We, You know what? We An hour and 20 minutes has gone by, and who'd have thunk it? That, that felt like it was five minutes. It is, and we didn't even get on to listing your favourite film. So I've got uh, – next time Mike's Shawshank away, Redemption. One of the best. What a film. One of the all-time all time best. I'll I'm not even going to talk two. about my can do a part two. This time make sure get you some caffeine in you. Make sure you're And in. I've got more and... more celebrity stories for you oh, as well. Lovely. And you won't have been gallivanting around the world for the last five weeks. Exactly. How did all your letters go from Tony? She wrote you a whole stack of letters, didn't she? Did that help 30. you get through it all? Yeah. One a day. Wow. But every day I was away. And how many so... days did you read and did was there a tear? There were, she even cut pictures out and put them in, like, they were little cards. And there were some of them that had pictures of us or Vinny and Vespa, um, you know, some of my favorite foods. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was. Has it been 20 odd years you've been together? Was it 19 years or something 19, like that? Been... Yeah, 19 years. Yeah. I know you remember recently you tweeted about it. Oh, wow. Yeah. You've got that spot. Look at that little grin you've got. You've got that magic. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're going to go Epic. otherwise. Uh, we're going to be here all night. Thank you very much, Sophie, for, for joining Thanks me. Thanks for having it's, me. It's been wonderful. Uh, everybody knows who you are over at the uh, the, um, the Sophie Squad. Yeah, the Sophie Squad at the Highbury <laughs> Squad with the magnificent Kev. In fact, Kev is such a nice. I said this on my show. Uh, the other day, we'd, after we're just after Everton won, and so they weren't going down, I just sent Kev a DM and said, I haven't spoken to you in a while. How are you doing? Immediately, he replied back. He said, I'm very good. How are you doing? I miss, I miss talking to you or something like that. He loves this you, This bloke won, prim- won, won titles with Arsenal. And he yes. replies to my DM. Yeah, he Gilly loves you. David Gilly doesn't reply to my DMs. <laughs> he's like, no, he's, he's terrible at writing back. He is. There, he I is, said uh... it out loud, Hilsey. <laughs> 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 but you need to get Kev and Hillier on. Those two are doing more shows next season because I know I five we, hours. It's, it's only um, it's because of Hillier's schedule and stuff like that. And um, but the, the Tuesday ish club was one of my favorite things we started last season. And, you know, he kind of had other things that he had to do. So hopefully we'll get him back next season. Excellent. Maybe try and get Andy Linnigan on if you need some plumbing advice. You know, <laughs> you know who's going to come on is um, on. Ian Selly, bless him. He's going to come on and do a few. I remember asking him for to come on ABW. This is before he went. He was still playing before he went. Did he go to Dubai? Arsenal yeah. Dubai? This must have been about six years ago. I asked him. I said, yeah, he said, yeah, I'll come on. He never got back to me. <laughs> and he's been to Dubai. He's got kids. He's come back here. He's doing something else. And he follows me on Twitter. He hasn't unfollowed me, which is amazing. Because if no, people he's don't a know lovely me, fella. they probably think all that shit I tweet. I mean, in fact, I've had to change my Twitter bio to I don't believe half the shit I tweet and all the <laughs> nor should you. So I've had people unfollow me that I know and they go, what did you say that about cats for? Kicking a cat. <laughs> I've got four fucking cats. I don't agree with Kurt Zuma at all. Anyway, down another line. Thank you very much, Sophie. You've been brilliant. Thank you much to, uh, I'll give you a little wave. I said, everybody in the chat, you have all been delightful. Um, fuck knows when we'll be back. I'm just going to go and try and get the, if you're looking for the Everton game, post game show, yeah, that clip of the crowds, YouTube didn't like it. And it's currently clipping it and editing it. So it'll take about a month before it finishes doing that. <laughs> so, uh, oh, Mark says thanks. And, I love uh, Mark. Mark's Terry a good guy. Says, thanks. Uh, Mark says Perry Groves. Perry Groves doesn't do podcasts, does he? He doesn't even do Not Twitter. Not really. He does, he, help, he does stuff for Mike, but that's because of the Gooners v. Cancer stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yes, lovely. Right, people, thank you very much, and we will see you all later.